Our presentation title today is Those Other Things I Hate to Do. Now, this is a uh, continuation of the last sermon that I did here, which was called Those Things I Hate to Do. It's also a continuation of the sermon before that, which was called What Are You Beholding? I was just going to skim over some of the things that we spoke back then, but I realized that there's a number of people, I counted at least 10 people that weren't there during those sermons. So I'm going to go a little bit more in, in depth in some of the things that you may have already heard. But I hear that repetition deepens impression. So that may not necessarily be a bad thing. You are easy to manipulate. I know because I realize that I am easy to manipulate. We looked at this the other week that a small stack of monopoly money can influence people to behave more selfishly without their knowledge and without their consent. We found that a picture of eyes can influence people to give more money without their knowledge and without their consent. And we also found that vague words pertaining to the elderly can make people walk slower without their knowledge and without their consent. And I know that when we hear this, you are easy to manipulate. Our instinct is to say, no, no, not me. Maybe this person to my left, maybe they're easy to manipulate, but not me. We don't like the thought that we're not in full control of our actions. We don't like the thought that people can influence us without our knowledge and without our consent. Nevertheless, this is the case. Our sight is easy to manipulate. Some of you may have seen this image before. It doesn't matter if you have. There are many forms of it. The question is, which one of these two tables is longer? Is this longer here? The table on the right, the width of that, is that longer? Or is the height of the table on the left? Which one appears longer? Yeah, the one on the left. Even those who know what this image is about will say that the one on the left appears longer. However, if you draw some lines and you draw them together, you'll actually realize that they are exactly the same size. It just appears that the one on the left is longer, and in fact, they are the same size. However, as soon as I take these lines away, you just forgot everything I said to you. The one on the left, again, appears longer than the one on the right. If I was to ask you, what is longer on the right, the line at the bottom or the line at the top? Which one appears longer? Yeah, the line on the top appears longer. But again, if we draw some lines, we realize that they are both exactly the same length. But again, when we remove those lines, just forgot everything I told you again, right? It appears longer on the top. Our eyes are easy to manipulate. I don't know about you, but this bugs me. Right? It bugs me that it's so easy to make me see something not the way that it actually is. There's an interesting study which really drew my attention, and it was a study that looked at the prevalence of people who are willing to donate their organs. So this is various graphs that show a number of countries and how likely they are to donate their organs. Now, you may very clearly see that the people on the right are much more willing to donate their organs than the people on the left. This brings the question, why? Why are the countries on the right so much more willing to participate in the organ donor program than the countries on the left? And I thought to myself, is there a cultural issue at play here? Is it because of the, the culture there? But then I looked at the, the countries and you have Denmark, 
with 4% and you have Sweden with 86%. They have fairly similar cultures. You look at the Netherlands and you look at Belgium. Again, they have similar culture. I remember I've been to both Germany and Austria. And from what I noticed, they have relatively similar culture there. But notice in Germany, only 12% of people are happy to donate their organs. So that means that out of 10,000 people, 8,800 will refuse to donate their organs. However, in Austria, it's, the figure is actually 99.98%. Uh, it's rounded up to 100% on this slide. So this means that out of 10,000 people in Austria, only two of them will refuse to donate their organs. So I thought, is it maybe because they don't get asked enough? In Netherlands, which you'll see has 28% who are willing to participate, they sent a letter from the government because they were running short on, on organs and people were dying. And they're saying, please, please participate in this program. They sent one of these letters to everyone who was eligible. You know, they say, begging only gets you so far. The figure is 28%, at least in Netherlands. Was it a religious issue? I, I couldn't think of any religious reasons why it may be like this. And then I realized that the reason it's like this is extremely trivial, or apparently so. You see, in the countries on the left, when you apply for your driver's license, there is a box. And it says this, check the box if you want to participate in the organ donor program. And what people do is they read this box, they don't check it, and they don't participate in the organ donor program. In the countries on the right, they have a similar box, but they have one extra word. And it says, check this box, if you don't want to participate in the organ donor program. And people do exactly the same thing. They read the box, they don't tick it, and they participate in the organ donor program. And I tried to understand why. I mean, this is something that, that's really important. Why do people behave like this? And I realized that it has to do with the difficulty of the question and with our defaults. You see, when a question is difficult, what people will tend to do is they will just go to the default. In this case, the question of whether you want to participate in the organ donor program, and you know, a number of people have heard issues where people have taken them off life support a little earlier, and they're like, oh, well, well that happened to me, and, but you know, there's people that need organs in, in, if, I, if I die, and what do I do? And they think about it, and because it's not an easy question, what they will do is they will go to the default. They did another study to see whether this actually affects professionals as well as lay people. I personally don't think it was necessary. They should have just looked at the numbers. If 99.98% of people in Austria went along with this, you would think that that would include professionals as well. But anyway, they did a study where they did a hypothetical medical scenario. Now remember when I was studying dentistry, they, they did this every week, you would get a new hypothetical medical scenario and they would give you more information as the week progressed and then towards the end of the week you'd come up with a treatment plan. This is what happened here. They got a bunch of doctors and they said, a patient presents to you who has hip pain. It is a 67 year old male who is a farmer and they have hip pain. And 
you have looked at treating this hip pain for a while now and you have tried absolutely everything that you can think of and nothing has worked. You have finally concluded that the only way to treat this is through hip surgery. But then, one week later, you decided to reevaluate the situation. And as you were reevaluating, you were looking over the file again, you noticed that you didn't try ibuprofen, more commonly known as Nurofen here in, in Australia. What do you do? Do you pull the patient back from the surgery and give them ibuprofen or not? You'll be pleased to hear that the majority of doctors said yes. They would pull the patient back and they would give them ibuprofen. The other half were given a slightly different scenario. So essentially, just before we get into that, the default here is hip surgery because it's already been decided. Right? The question that was asked was relatively simple. Do we have hip surgery or do you give them ibuprofen? The other group, there was an extra step added. Essentially what they were told is everything was the same except when you re-examine the file you realized that you had neglected to give them ibuprofen and pyroxicam. Pyroxicam is another non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So what do you do? Do you pull them back from hip surgery and if you do, which one do you give them? Do you give them ibuprofen or pyroxicam? The vast majority of the doctors in this study decided to let the patients have hip surgery. This should concern you, right? It, it concerns me. Essentially, because the problem slightly became a bit more difficult and it wasn't overly difficult by any means, right? There was just one extra step in the process. Their mind went back to the default. Defaults are very important in our decision-making process. We are easy to manipulate. Lay people and professionals alike. Last time I was here, we looked at the question, why do we sometimes do the things that we hate? Why do we sometimes behave in ways that we, we know we shouldn't? And we looked at the verse that says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And we asked ourselves, why do we sometimes do the things that we hate? And what we found out is that the decision-making process is highly influenced by two things. One is our logical brain. The way that we analyze information generally takes place in the frontal lobe. This highly influences our decision-making process, but there is another thing, which is the heart. Or, as we looked at it, the, the emotions, the way we feel about things. We sometimes do things that we logically know we shouldn't, like I sometimes have an extra cupcake, when I know I shouldn't, because my emotions take over. And what we discussed was that the way to bring our heart, our emotions, and our brain into alignment with God's will is by spending time with God. When we spend time with God, our heart comes in alignment with His will for us. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, there's an interesting verse where, where it speaks about our behavior. And I really like the interplay between grace and works here. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Here, we're told that to present yourselves as being alive from the dead, Jesus, through the price that he paid for us, 
that he offered us by grace has raised us from the dead. And as a result of that, what we're expected to do in response to this is not to let sin reign in our mortal body. Peter writes a similar verse. He says, He who himself borne our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, may live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, you have here, Jesus offers us salvation by grace. It's not nothing that we do. right? He says, He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And then as a result of seeing what Jesus has done for us, we die to sin and we try to, to live for righteousness. It says, by whose stripes you were healed. He has died for us in order to heal us from our sinful condition. The decision-making process involves our conscious mind and our heart, but there is also another part to it, which is the subconscious or the semi-conscious. These are decisions that are highly, highly influenced by our defaults. Which raises a very important question. What determines our defaults? What determines where we go to when we don't think or we have little time to think or when decisions are, are too hard to make? What influences our defaults? There is a verse that we looked at a few weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 3.18, which says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here, what we're being told is that as we look at God, we are being transformed into the same image. A good way to summarize this verse is by beholding, we become changed. When we spend time with God, we become changed and become more like Him. I gave the example that my beautiful wife, Gabrielle, is an amazing person. And I've taken on many of her positive character attributes. I'm more patient. I'm more kind because of her. But I've also taken some things from her which I wish I hadn't. Right? As I said, I find myself saying basil and tomato, tomato, sorry, and trunk. These are starting to become my default. I find myself, I almost, I think I say basil like 100% of the time now. This has become my default. And the reason it's become my default is because I'm around it all the time. Every time I hear this, this becomes my default. The things around us highly influence our behavior. Now, we also looked at if beholding God can make us more like Him, what does beholding the enemy do? One of the founders of the Adventist Church writes for us a statement which we looked at as well. It says, those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing or hearing that which would suggest impure thoughts. I was thinking of that first line there. It says, those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices. That word prey just brought to my mind some images. You know, a rabbit falls prey to a hawk, right? An antelope falls prey to a lion, right? It can be quite fatal to fall prey to someone. What she's saying here is if you want to avoid falling prey to Satan, you must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. Now, I also shared that I used to spend a lot of time in my life watching all kinds of rubbish. I would spend hours every day. I shared with you before one of the shows I used to watch. I'm going to share a couple more. Right? One of the shows that I used to watch was called Game of Thrones. I'm not going to go into this show at all. I'm not going to tell you what it's about or what happens in this show. I just want to draw your attention to the bottom of the cover, right there next to the very godly phrase, all men must die. Right? It says, R, 
18 plus, high impact violence. And I remember when I saw this, I used to think to myself, ah, well, this doesn't really affect me. And the reason I thought that is because I'm not a violent person. Violence is very foreign to me. You know the saying, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another, lives to fight another day? I'm the one who runs away. Right? I think I have an allergy to being hit because I swell up. So I will do anything I can avoid to get into a, a physical conflict. And I thought, well, I, I don't have a violent nature. So this, how, how can this impact me? And then I started to think about this. And I realized that most of these shows will have a hero and a villain. And the hero, in the end, gets the villain and he gets what he deserves. And as we, we watch these shows, there's always revenge. People getting what they deserve. And I thought about this. This is something we see constantly. And is it any surprise that the attitude of turn the other cheek is... It almost sounds ridiculous in today's society. What, you mean if someone hits me on one cheek, you expect me to turn the other, let them hit me again? Our default is retaliation. Our default is not to turn the other cheek. Our default is revenge because this is what we're seeing around us all the time. Another show I used to watch was Las Vegas. Again, I'm not going to tell you anything about this, but I'm just going to draw your attention to the warning. It says mature themes, violence, sexual references, moderate sex scenes, nudity, coarse language, and adult themes. And I'm going to ask the question that I asked before, a few weeks ago. Do you think that moderate sex scenes suggest impure thoughts? What if there were low-level sex scenes? Would that be all right? <laughs> this is so prevalent in our world today. Right? If you look just at this show, Sexual references, moderate sex scenes, nudity, adult themes, right? This is so prevalent in our world today, and the default becomes lust. It, it's the default. I heard a story which really, really impressed me, and it's it stuck in my mind for, for many years after I've heard it. I don't remember who said it. I wish I did. But it was a true story that they said this happened with their, with their son. Their son was having a, essentially he's having a party. And he invited a bunch of his friends and they were going to watch a movie. And they were all there and he comes up to his son and he says, now this movie that you're going to watch, is this something that's fit for Christian consumption? And his son said, yes, yes, it's a comedy, it's, it's, a, it's a good movie, it's a good movie, dad. He's like, okay, okay. Does this movie have coarse language? Oh, you know, only, only a tiny little bit. It, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's like, okay. What about sex scenes? Does this movie have sex scenes? Like, oh, just, just, just a couple. It, it, it's, it's a good movie. It's a really good movie. It's fit for Christians. What about violence? Does it have any violence? Said, oh, you know, again, just, just a couple of scenes. Dad, it, it's really, it's a good movie. And he said, okay. And his dad walked away and went to the local cake shop and bought his son's favorite cake. And came into the room and he said, son, I've bought you your favorite cake. And his son was like, oh, dad, you're the best. Thank you, thank you so much. He said, but as I was coming home, I noticed a dry piece of dog poo on the road and I stepped on it and crushed it and sprinkled a little bit of dog poo on your cake. But it's only a tiny little bit, it's all right. There are certain things that even a tiny little bit of is a bit too much. 
I spent much of my life consuming dog poo. And not just little sprinkles, but like big bowlfuls. Right? And what I noticed is that this shaped my defaults. As I was trying to come to God, as I was trying to give my life to God, I found it so, so difficult. Because the default position in my life was to go against God's will. We're told that by beholding, we become changed. By beholding God, we are being transformed into His image. By beholding the enemy, we are being transformed into His image. You see, the enemy doesn't attack us and tell us, oh, completely turn around and go the other way, right? He doesn't come and say, Steve, I want you to stop worshipping God and come worship me. He doesn't do that. And the reason he doesn't do that is because he's not stupid, right? If that was the case, Steve would be, you know, get lost, you're doomed. The enemy comes by degrees. I know you're going this way, but if you look just one degree to the right, you're still going in the same direction, and this path is much more pleasant. That's how he attacks us. And slowly, our defaults get changed. Slowly, we think, ah, maybe we shouldn't always turn the other cheek. Slowly, we get moved another degree, another degree, another degree, till when we look back, we realize that we are so far off the mark to where we want to be. Our defaults highly influence our decision-making process. Our subconscious is really important to our decision-making process. You see, when we make a decision, we have the conscious mind, where we look at the facts, where we make informed decisions, but what also is influenced is our emotions, the way that we feel about things. And when we bring our life, we bring our life in alignment with God's will when we spend more time with Him and bring our heart into alignment with His will. But there is also the subconscious. There is also those defaults in our life where when decisions are either not thought about or when decisions are even a little bit difficult, we tend back to our defaults. I wanted to ask you today, what are the things that is influencing your defaults? What are the kinds of things that you are consuming that end up shaping the person you are? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you want to draw us closer and closer to you. Lord, help us to turn our eyes towards you, Lord, to focus on you, that we may bring our will in alignment with yours. We pray these things in Jesus' name.